This was too much for the forced calmness under which the assistant commissioner had, for upwards of eighteen months, concealed his irritation with the system and the subordinates of his office. A square peg forced into a round hole, he had felt like a daily outrage that long-established smooth roundness into which a man of less sharply angular shape would have fitted himself with voluptuous acquiescence after a shrug or two. What he resented most was just the necessity of taking so much on trust. At the little laugh of Chief Inspector Heats, he spun swiftly on his heels, as if whirled away from the window pane by an electric shock. He caught on the latter's face not only the complacency proper to the occasion lurking under the mustache, but the vestiges of experimental watchfulness in the round eyes, which had been, no doubt, fastened on his back, and now met his glance for a second before the intent character of their stare had the time to change to a merely startled appearance. The assistant commissioner of police had really some qualifications for his post. Suddenly, his suspicion was awakened. It is but fair to say that his suspicions of the police methods, unless the police happened to be a semi-military body organized by himself, was not difficult to arouse. If it ever slumbered from sheer weariness, it was but lightly, and his appreciation of Chief Inspector Heat's zeal and ability moderate in itself excluded all notion of moral confidence. He's up to something, he exclaimed mentally, and at once became angry. Crossing over to his desk with headlong strides, he sat down violently. Here I am, stuck in a litter of paper, he reflected, with unreasonable resentment supposed to hold all the threads in my hand, and yet I can but hold what is put in my hand and nothing else, and they can fasten the other ends of the th threads where they please. He raised his head and turned towards his subordinate, a long, meager face with the accentuated features of an energetic Don Quixote. Now, what is it you've got up your sleeve? The other stared. He stared without winking, in a perfect immobility of his round eyes, as he was used to stare at the various members of the criminal class, when, after being duly cautioned, they made their statements in the tone of injured innocence, or false simplicity, or sullen resignation. But behind that professional and stony fixity there was some surprise, too, for in such a tone, combining nicely the note of contempt and impatience, Chief Inspector Heat, the right-hand man of the department, was not used to being addressed. He began in a procrastinating manner, like a man taken unawares by a new and unexpected experience. What I've got against that Michaelis, you mean, sir? The assistant commissioner watched the bullet head, the points of that Norse rover's mustache, falling below the line of the heavy jaw, the whole full and pale physiognomy, whose determined character was marred by too much flesh, at the cunning wrinkles radiating from the outer corners of the eyes, and in that purposeful contemplation of the valuable and trusted officer, he drew a conviction so sudden that it moved him like an inspiration. I have reason to think that when you came into this room, he said in measured tones, it was not Michaelis who is in your mind, not principally, Perhaps not at all. 
You have reason to think, sir, muttered Chief Inspector Heat, with every appearance of astonishment, which came up to a certain point, was genuine enough. He had discovered in this affair a delicate and perplexing side, forcing upon the discoverer a certain amount of insincerity, that sort of insincerity which, under the names of skill, prudence, discretion, turns up at one point or another in most human affairs. He felt at the moment like a tightrope artist might feel if suddenly, in the middle of the performance, the manager of the music hall were to rush out of the proper managerial seclusion and begin to shake the rope. Indignation, the sense of moral insecurity engendered by such a treacherous proceeding joined to the immediate apprehension of a broken neck would, in the colloquial phrase, put him in a state. And there would be also some scandalized concern for his art, too, since a man must identify himself with something more tangible than his own personality and establish his pride somewhere, either in his social position or in the quality of the work he is obliged to do, or simply in the superiority of the idleness he may be fortunate enough to enjoy. Yes, said the assistant commissioner, I have. I do not mean to say that you have not thought of Michaelis at all, but you are giving the fact that you've mentioned a prominence which strikes me as not quite candid, Inspector Heat. If that is really the track of discovery, why haven't you followed it up at once, either personally or by sending one of your men to that village? Do you think, sir, I have failed in my duty there? The chief inspector asked, in a tone which he sought to make simply reflective. Forced unexpectedly to concentrate his faculties upon the task of preserving his balance, he had seized upon that point and exposed himself to a rebuke for the assistant commissioner, frowning slightly, observed that this was a very improper remark to make. But since you've made it, he continued coldly, I'll tell you that this is not my meaning. He paused with a straight glance of his sunken eyes, which was a full equivalent of the unspoken termination, and you know it. The head of the so-called Special Crimes Department, debarred by his position from going out of doors personally in quest of secrets, locked up in guilty breasts, had a propensity to exercise his considerable gifts for the detection of incriminating truth upon his own subordinates. That peculiar instinct could hardly be called a weakness. It was natural. He was a born detective. It had unconsciously governed his choice of a career, and if it ever failed him in life, it was perhaps in the one exceptional circumstance of his marriage, which was also natural. It fed, since it could not roam abroad, upon the human material, which was brought to it in its official seclusion, we can never cease to be ourselves. His elbow on the desk, his thin legs crossed, and nursing his cheek in the palm of his meager hand, the assistant commissioner in charge of the special crimes branch was getting hold of the case with growing interest. His chief inspector, if not an absolutely worthy foeman of his penetration, was at any rate the most worthy of all within his reach. A mistrust of established reputations was strictly in character with the assistant commissioner's ability as detector. His memory evoked a certain old, fat, and wealthy native chief in the distant colony whom it was a tradition for the successive colonial governors to trust and make 
much of as a firm friend and supporter of the order and legality established by white men, whereas when examined skeptically, he was found out to be principally his own good friend and nobody else's. Not precisely a traitor, but still a man of many dangerous reservations in his fidelity, caused by a due regard for his own advantage, comfort, and safety, a fellow of some innocence in his naive duplicity, but nonetheless dangerous. He took some finding out. He was physically a big man, too, and allowing for the difference of color, of course. Chief Inspector Heath's appearance recalled him to the memory of his superior. It was not the eyes, nor yet the lips, exactly. It was bizarre. But does not Alfred Wallace relate in his famous book on the Malay archipelago how amongst the Uru Islanders he discovered in an old and naked savage with a sooty skin in a peculiar resemblance to a dear friend at home. For the first time since he took up his appointment, the assistant commissioner felt as if he were going to do some real work for his salary, and that was a pleasurable sensation. I'll turn him inside out like an old glove, thought the assistant commissioner, with his eyes resting pensively upon Chief Inspector Heat. No, that was not my thought, he began again. There is no doubt about you knowing your business, no doubt at all, and that's precisely why I, he stopped short and changing his tone, what could you bring up against Michaelis of a definite nature? I mean, apart from the fact that the two men under suspicion, you're certain there were two of them, came last from a railway station within three miles of the village where Michaelis is now living. This by itself is enough for us to go on, sir, with that sort of man, said the chief inspector, with returning composure. The slight improving movement of the assistant commissioner's head went far to pacify the resentful astonishment of the renowned officer for Chief Inspector Heat was a kind man, an excellent husband, a devoted father, and the public and departmental confidence he enjoyed acting favorably upon an amiable nature disposed him to feel friendly towards the successive assistant commissioners he had seen pass through that very room. There had been three in his time. The first one, a soldierly, abrupt, red-faced person with white eyebrows and an explosive temper could be managed with a silken thread. He left on reaching the age limit. The second, a perfect gentleman, knowing his own and everybody else's place to a nicety, on resigning to take up a higher appointment out of England, got decorated, for really Inspector Heath's services. To work with him had been a pride and a pleasure. The third, a bit of a dark horse from the first, was at the end of eighteen months something of a dark horse still to the department. Upon the whole Chief Inspector Heath believed him to be in the main harmless, odd-looking, but harmless, he was speaking now, and the chief inspector listened, with outward deference, which means nothing, being a matter of duty, and inwardly with benevolent toleration. Michaelis reported himself before leaving London for the country. Yes, sir, he did. And what may he be doing there, continued the assistant commissioner, who was perfectly informed on that point, fitted with painful tightness into an old wooden armchair before a worm-eaten oak table in an upstairs room of a four-roomed cottage with a roof of moss-grown tiles. Michaelis was writing night and day in a shaky, slanting hand that autobiography of a prisoner 
which was to be like a book of revelation in the history of mankind, the conditions of confined space, seclusion, and solitude in a small four-roomed cottage were favorable to his inspiration. It was like being in prison, except that one was never disturbed for the odious purpose of taking exercise according to the tyrannical regulations of his old home and the penitentiary. He could not tell whether the sun still shone on the earth or not. The perspiration of the literary labor dropped from his brow. A delightful enthusiasm urged him on. It was the liberation of his inner life the letting out of his soul into the wide world, and the zeal of his guileless vanity, first awakened by the offer of five hundred pounds from a publisher, seemed something predestined and holy. It would be, of course, most desirable to be informed exactly, insisted the assistant commissioner uncandidly. Chief Inspector Heat, conscious of renewed irritation at this display of scrupulousness, said that the county police had been notified from the first of Michaelis's arrival, and that a full report could be obtained in a few hours, a wire to the superintendent. Thus he spoke rather slowly, while his mind seemed already to be weighing the consequences. A slight knitting of the brow was the outward sign of this, but he was interrupted by a question. You sent that wire already? No, sir, he answered, as if surprised. The assistant commissioner uncrossed his legs suddenly. The briskness of that movement contrasted with the casual way in which he threw out a suggestion. Would you think that Michaelis had anything to do with the preparation of that bomb, for instance? The chief inspector assumed a reflective manner. I wouldn't say so. There's no necessity to say anything at present. He associates with men who are classed as dangerous. He was made a delegate of the Red Committee less than a year after his release on license. A sort of compliment, I suppose. And the chief inspector laughed a little angrily, a little scornfully. With a man of that sort, scrupulousness was a misplaced and even an illegal sentiment. The celebrity bestowed upon Michaelis on his release two years ago by some emotional journalists in want of special copy had rankled ever since in his breast. It was perfectly legal to arrest that man on the barest suspicion. It was legal and expedient on the face of it. His two former chiefs would have seen the point at once, whereas this one, without saying either yes or no, sat there as if lost in a dream. Moreover, Besides being legal and expedient, the arrest of Michaelis solved a little personal difficulty which worried Chief Inspector Heat somewhat. This difficulty had its bearing upon his reputation, upon his comfort, and even upon the efficient performance of his duties. For if Michaelis no doubt knew something about this outrage, the Chief Inspector was fairly certain that he did not know too much. This was just as well. He knew much less. The chief inspector was positive than certain other individuals he had in his mind, but whose arrest seemed to him inexpedient, besides being a more complicated matter on account of the rules of the game. The rules of the game did not protect so much Michaelis who was an ex-convict, it would be stupid not to take advantage of legal facilities, and the journalists who had written him up with emotional gush would be ready to write him down with emotional indignation. 
This prospect, viewed with confidence, had the attraction of a personal triumph for Chief Inspector Heat, and deep down in his blameless bosom of an average married citizen, almost unconscious but potent nevertheless, the dislike of being compelled by events to meddle with the desperate ferocity of the professor had its say. This dislike had been strengthened by the chance of meeting in the lane. The encounter did not leave behind with Chief Inspector Heat that satisfactory sense of superiority the members of the police force get from the unofficial but intimate side of their intercourse with the criminal classes, by which the vanity of power is soothed and the vulgar love of domination over our fellow creatures is flattered as worthily as it deserves. The perfect anarchist was not recognized as a fellow creature by Chief Inspector Heat. He was impossible, a mad dog to be left alone. Not that the Chief Inspector was afraid of him. On the contrary, he meant to have him some day, but not yet. He meant to get hold of him in his own time, properly and effectively, according to the rules of the game. The present was not the right time for attempting that feat, not the right time for many reasons, personal and of public service. This being the strong feeling of Inspector Heat, it appeared to him just and proper that this affair should be shunted off its obscure and inconvenient track, leading goodness knows where, into a quiet and lawful siding called Michaelis. And he repeated, as if reconsidering the suggestion consciously, the bomb, no, I would not say that exactly. We may never find that out, but it's clear that he is connected with this in some way, which we can find out without much trouble. His countenance had that look of grave, overbearing indifference, once well known and much dreaded by the better sort of thieves. Chief Inspector Heat, though what is called a man, was not a smiling animal, but his inward state was that of satisfaction at the passively receptive attitude of the assistant commissioner, who murmured gently, and you really think that the investigation should be made in that direction? I do, sir. Quite convinced. I am, sir. That's the true line for us to take. The assistant commissioner withdrew the support of his hand from his reclining head with a suddenness that, considering his languid attitude, seemed to menace his whole person with collapse. But on the contrary, he sat up, extremely alert, behind the great writing table on which his hand had fallen with the sound of a sharp blow. What I want to know is what put it out of your head till now. Put it out of my head, repeated the chief inspector very slowly. Yes, till you were called into this room, you know. The chief inspector felt as if the air between his clothing and his skin had become unpleasantly hot. It was the sensation of an unprecedented and incredible experience. Of course, he said, exaggerating the deliberation of his utterance to the utmost limits of possibility, if there is a reason, of which I know nothing, for not interfering with the convict Michaelis, Perhaps it's just as well I didn't start the county police after him. This took such a long time to say that the unflagging attention of the assistant commissioner seemed a wonderful feat of endurance. His retort came without delay. No reason whatever that I know of. Come, Chief Inspector, this finessing with me is highly improper on your part. Highly improper. And it's also unfair, you know, 
You shouldn't leave me to puzzle things out for myself like this. Really, I am surprised. He paused, then added smoothly, I need scarcely tell you that this conversation is altogether unofficial. These words were far from pacifying the chief inspector. The indignation of a betrayed tightrope performer was strong within him. In his pride of a trusted servant, he was affected by the assurance that the rope was not shaken for the purpose of breaking his neck, as by an exhibition of impudence, as if anybody were afraid. Assistant commissioners come and go, but a valuable chief inspector is not an ephemeral office phenomenon. He was not afraid of getting a broken neck. To have his performance spoiled was more than enough to account for the glow of honest indignation, and as thought is no respecter of persons, the thought of Chief Inspector Heat took a threatening and prophetic shape. You, my boy, he said to himself, keeping his round and habitually roving eyes fastened upon the assistant commissioner's face, you, my boy, you don't know your place, and your place won't know you very long either, I bet. As if in provoking answer to that thought, something like the ghost of an amiable smile passed on the lips of the assistant commissioner. His manner was easy and businesslike, while he persisted in administering another shake to the tightrope. Let us come now to what you have discovered on the spot, Chief Inspector, he said. A fool and his job are soon parted, went on the train of prophetic thought in Chief Inspector Heat's head. But it was immediately followed by the reflection that a higher official, even when fired out, this was the precise image, has still the time as he flies through the door to launch a nasty kick at the shin bones of a subordinate. Without softening very much the basilic nature of his stare, he said impassively, We are coming to that part of my investigation, sir. That's right. Well, what have you brought away from it? The chief inspector, who made up his mind to jump off the rope, came to the ground with gloomy frankness. I've brought away an address, he said, pulling out of his pocket without haste a singed rag of dark blue cloth. This belongs to the overcoat the fellow who got himself blown to pieces was wearing. Of course the overcoat may not have been his, and may even have been stolen, but that's not at all probable if you look at this. The chief inspector, stepping up to the table, smoothed out carefully the rag of blue cloth. He had picked it up from the repulsive heap in the mortuary, because a tailor's name is found sometimes under the collar. It is not often of much use, but still. He only half expected to find anything useful, but certainly he did not expect to find not under the collar at all, but stitched carefully on the underside of the lapel a square piece of calico with an address written on it in marking ink. The chief inspector removed his smoothing hand. I carried it off with me without anybody taking notice, he said. I thought it best. I can always be produced if required. The assistant commissioner, rising a little in his chair, pulled the cloth over to his side of the table. He sat looking at it in silence. Only the number 32 and the name of Brett Street were written in marking ink on a piece of calico slightly larger than an ordinary cigarette paper. He was genuinely surprised.